The Life of Victoria, Princess Royal and German Empress Victoria was the eldest child of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom and Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. She was born on the 21st of November 1840. Her parents had hoped for a son and heir and were disappointed when their first child was a girl. Even the doctor that delivered the baby knew of the disappointment her birth would cause when he announced to the Queen that she had given birth to a daughter. Upon hearing that they had a daughter, the Queen remarked, Don't worry, the next one will be a boy. Victoria was lovingly called Vicky by her family for the rest of her life. Though Victoria did love her daughter, her relationship with Vicky was distant, perhaps due to Victoria's own upbringing. Albert quickly devised an educational regime for his daughter. Vicky went to great lengths to please her parents and grew up to be an intelligent young woman on par with her father's intellect. Vicky learned everything from mathematics to philosophy and became very liberal in her thinking. From the age of 18 months, she began to learn French and at the age of four, she was fluent in both French and German. From a young age, Vicky's parents searched for a suitable husband for their daughter. Prince Frederick William of Prussia was chosen and Vicky met him for the first time at the Great Exhibition in 1851. Eager to impress, Vicky made a good impression on the prince and the pair remained in contact when the prince returned to Prussia, sending letters to each other. Four years later, in 1855, Frederick returned to Britain and asked for the young princess's hand in marriage. At 15, she was too young to marry, and her parents asked that they wait until Vicky was 17. The Prussian court were outraged at the marriage proposal, believing the British monarchy to be weak as a constitutional monarchy. They also did not think that the Princess Royal was a suitable match for the future King of Prussia. The British press were also not a fan of the groom either. Vicky's own mother worried that her daughter was not beautiful and tall enough for the Prince, but she needn't have worried. The pair were in love. For the next two years, the wedding details were finalised with much arguments between the two families. Vicky wanted to bring two of her ladies-in-waiting with her to Prussia, but she was refused by her future in-laws. The Prussian royal family demanded that as the groom's family, they should have the final say in the wedding matters. They believed that the couple should wed in Prussia but Queen Victoria was never one to not get her way and refused to allow the couple to wed outside Britain. Despite all the fighting in the families, Vicky and Frederick did have a fairy tale wedding in St. James's Palace on the 25th of January 1858. As the bride of a foreign prince, Vicky was to move to Prussia after the wedding. Though a wonderful start to their married life, things would only get worse for Vicky when she moved to Berlin, with her in-laws intent on making Vicky's life a living hell. Frederick's uncle, King Frederick William IV of Prussia, was not happy with the match and he made it known through his actions. He gave the young couple a derelict wing of the Berlin Royal Palace. It was outdated and in disrepair. Vicky received a cold welcome from her new homeland and high expectations of her duties were placed on her shoulders. She was expected to attend formal dinners and events almost every night, staying up past midnight before waking up at dawn to greet guests. In order to fit in with her new family, Vicky had to do things their way, oftentimes placing herself in her mother's wrath. When the Duchess of Orleans, a relative of both Vicky and Frederick, died, 
Vicky had to make a decision that would damn her no matter what she chose. The Prussian court mourned for a week, while the British court mourned for a month. Vicky chose to follow the Prussian court, and Queen Victoria berated her daughter for not following the English traditions, sending many demanding letters to her daughter, only stopping at the behest of Prince Albert. Vicky loved to garden, and hoped to continue to do so in Prussia. She began to use English techniques on the gardens of her new home, but insulted the Prussian gardeners' gardening skills while doing so. Despite being members of the royal family, Vicky and Frederick struggled financially. The king gave Frederick an allowance, but it was not enough for the couple to make ends meet, as they were expected to dress finely. Vicky had to dip into her own dowry. Like her mother, Vicky had many children. Within a year of marriage, she was pregnant, and in January 1859, she gave birth to her first child, a son named Willem. Her first delivery was traumatic. The maid delayed getting a doctor when Vicky went into labour, and Vicky nearly died during the delivery. Her son was in the breech position, making the delivery long and difficult. Eventually, her son was born, but with a nerve injury to his left arm, which left Willem with Herb's palsy. Vicky was embarrassed by her son's disability and felt it reflected badly on her. When she saw the extent of her newborn's disability, the doctors tried to console the princess, telling her that the arm would heal. It didn't, and by the time Willem was an adult, his left arm was much shorter than his right arm. Vicky went to extreme lengths to try to cure her son's disability, not wanting to accept her son as he was. She would tie his uninjured arm behind his back, hoping that by restricting that arm, he would have to use his left arm. Wilhelm was also subjected to electrotherapy almost every day of his young life and animal baths in which his left arm was placed in the body of a freshly slaughtered hare. These treatments were abusive and did not cure nor help his condition. They caused the prince great distress and he grew to hate his mother. Vicky went on to have a further seven children, Charlotte, Henry, Sigismund, Victoria, Valdemar, Sophia and Margaret. None of the other births were as traumatic as her first. In 1861, her father died suddenly at the age of 42 plunging her mother into deep mourning for the rest of her life. Vicky was devastated at the death of her beloved father and she returned to Britain to comfort her grieving mother and family and also to attend the funeral. In 1866, Vicky's fourth child, Sigismund, died tragically at the age of 21 months after falling ill with meningitis. She received little support from those around her and Vicky was left to mourn for the loss of her child by herself. Her youngest, Voldemar, would also tragically pass in 1879 at the age of 11, again receiving very little support from the Prussian court. One of Vicky's decisions would go on to have catastrophic consequences for Prussia, although that would not occur until well after Vicky's own death. She hired a tutor for her children, and Willem was influenced by him, believing in his own divine right to rule autocratically, which influenced how he would later rule in life. The people hated Vicky, and she tried everything to get them to like her. She set up a military hospital to tend to the wounded during the endless conflict that plagued her country but the king demanded that she stop her theatrics of charity. Nothing she did would make the people like her, as she and her husband were liberal and the German people were not. Vicky's husband's health began to fail. Frederick had issues with his throat and it would swell to the point where he had difficulty talking and breathing. The doctors diagnosed him with cancerous tumour, recommending that he have it surgically removed. 
Despite the advice, Frederick and Vicky refused any treatment which caused outrage amongst their surviving children. Willem travelled to see them and accused his mother of being happy that her husband was dying. Frederick's father, Willem I, died on the 9th of March 1888 and Frederick became Frederick III. Frederick was more of a shadow king as he was gravely ill and would not be king for long. Vicky wanted to protect her legacy, knowing that once her son became king, he would destroy her reputation. She had boxes of her letters sent to Windsor Castle in Britain for safekeeping. Frederick ruled for only 99 days, dying on the 15th of June 1888. Willem became king and immediately betrayed his mother. He had a private residences ransacked and searched for incriminating information. Nothing was found due to Vicky's quick thinking. Vicky was excluded from court and worked for charitable organisations like the Red Cross. By 1898, her health had begun to fail. Vicky was suffering from terminal breast cancer and she devoted her final years to art and spent long hours writing letters. Her illness often caused her to spend long hours in bed. Only months after her mother's own death, Vicky passed away on the 5th of August 1901. She was buried beside her husband in the Royal Mausoleum at Potsdam. The Life of Edward VII the future King Edward VII was born on the 9th of November 1841, less than a year after his elder sister Victoria was born. He was named Albert after his father, but nicknamed Bertie. Though a second child, as a boy, Bertie was heir to the throne of the United Kingdom. His parents wanted to give him the best education possible as the heir and his father took a particular interest in young Bertie's studies. Bertie was not academically inclined, but was quite charming, something that would help him later in life. Due to this, his parents were disappointed, and this feeling of failure caused Bertie to become withdrawn. At 19, Bertie toured North America with much success. He laid a stone on Parliament Hill watched a tightrope walker walk across Niagara Falls, and he stayed with President Buchanan in the White House. This trip opened his mind to a new way of life, and he greatly enjoyed it. He returned to Britain, exhilarated and more confident in his abilities than ever before. His new confidence pushed him towards his greatest interest, women. As the Prince of Wales, Bertie was expected to marry and have children. His parents sent him to Germany in 1861 under the guise of watching military manoeuvres. On this trip, he met Princess Alexandra of Denmark, a princess who his parents were keen for him to marry. The two young people hit it off and it didn't take long before their families were arranging the wedding. However, there was just one snag in the plan. Bertie was already romancing and seducing other women. Before he travelled to Germany, Bertie had been in Ireland to gain military experience. When his friends discovered he had never been with a woman, the men snuck an actress into the camp called Nellie Clifton and Nellie would be the first of many women who would sleep with the future king. Rumours of his dalliances got back to his parents and his father travelled to Ireland to scold and warn his son of the harm that Bertie was causing. By this time in November 1861, Bertie's father's health had begun to fail and only weeks later, Prince Albert was dead. The death of Prince Albert sparked a hatred in Victoria so deep that she blamed Bertie for his father's death and never forgave him. The wedding between Bertie and Alexandra was postponed until the 10th of March 1863. Bertie married the princess as his father had wished, but he was not going to be faithful to his new wife. Their marriage vows were more of a guideline than a binding law. His infidelities earned him the nickname Dirty Bertie. 
his wife accepted his unfaithfulness, mostly ignoring it as most Victorian women did in those days. It is believed that Edward VII had at least 55 mistresses throughout his life. However, he never acknowledged any illegitimate children. He was either the most careful man alive or he was lying about the consequences of his lovemaking. His mother's disapproval of her eldest son only grew when in 1869 Bertie was involved in a divorce scandal. Sir Charles Mordaunt, a member of Parliament, planned to divorce his wife and was planning to name Bertie as a contributing factor. Evidence of an affair came in the form of letters that the Prince of Wales had written to Mordaunt's wife and the husband finding the two together alone in Mordaunt's house. Though Bertie was not listed as a reason for the divorce in the official documents, rumours and gossip spread, proving that Bertie was the cause of the marriage breakdown. His reputation was damaged. However, this didn't last long and Bertie was once again popular for his charisma and entertaining stories. His popularity grew when in 1871 he caught typhoid fever, the same illness that was rumoured to have killed his father. He survived and the people grew to love him more. The public believed him to be a kind soul as he always treated everyone with respect no matter class or colour. His letters revealed that he was disgusted by racism and his remarks were completely against the thinking of the time. At of the time, in more ways than one, Bertie was a fashion icon for men. He shaped European style, wearing tweed suits, humber hats and Norfolk jackets. At black tie events, he wore a simple black tie instead of the white ties and tails, a tradition which has stuck to this day. If you thought Bertie's affairs were over, you would be mistaken. While he was able to keep most of his affairs under wraps, Bertie would slip up again. In 1877, while at the theatre, a young actress caught his eye, called Lily Langtry. He pursued her, even though she was married. At the dinner party afterwards, Bertie charmed Lily and they hit it off. It wasn't long before she ended up in bed with him and the couple became gossip in Victorian London. The affair continued for three years but came to an end when Lily became pregnant. They continued to have a strong friendship for years afterwards. Historians believe that Bertie was not the father as Lily was also sleeping with other men at the time. Though the heir to the British throne, Bertie's mother refused to allow him to partake in any state business. She did not trust him with state affairs and as a result Bertie spent much of his time partying in Paris and spending much of his time in brothels. Second to his love of women came his love of food. His wife's line had grown so much that it was intruding on his bedroom antics and he had a love chair made so it would be easier for him to keep up with his favourite hobby. Despite being perpetually unfaithful to his wife, Bertie and Alexandra had six children, Albert Victor, George, Louise, Victoria, Maud and Alexander John. Their sixth and final child, Alexander John, passed away just a day after he was born, leaving the couple devastated. As they laid their son to rest in his tiny casket, Bertie reportedly had tears rolling down his cheeks. Bertie managed to stay away from too many scandals until 1890 when he attended a baccarat game that was attended by many upper class members of society. However, this game was highly illegal and during the game the host Arthur Wilson caught Sir William Gordon Cumming cheating. This scandal would rock the royal family for years. Bertie was called as a witness in court for the cheating. Gordon Cumming was found guilty and Bertie's reputation took a massive hit. The death of his eldest son, Albert Victor, in 1892 would bring Bertie and his mother closer together. He wrote to his mother of the devastation the death of his eldest son brought him and that he would have given his life in favour of his sons. Eventually, Queen Victoria passed away on the 22nd of January 1901 at the age of 81.
and Bertie became the king at 59 years of age. He took the regnal name of Edward VII. During the 1890s, Bertie was allowed to view state papers in secret, given to him by cabinet, something his mother was not aware of. Before Bertie's coronation, he suffered from appendicitis and had to have his appendix removed. The surgery was a success and it popularised the treatment. His coronation was held on the 9th of August 1902. At his coronation, Bertie invited some of his mistresses and this earned him a new nickname, Edward the Caresser. Despite his awful nicknames, Bertie was popular and the public loved him. His mother's reign had been gloomy after the death of her husband. Bertie's reign was one that lifted that gloom. However, he would only reign for just under 10 years. By 1909, his health started to decline and on one occasion, he even fainted during a state visit to Berlin. His health failed at the worst time, as the government was in crisis and needed their monarch to be strong. A liberal government had been elected, but the Conservative House of Lords vetoed everything the government passed. The king worked until the end and was a good monarch, despite what his mother had believed him to be. On the 6th of May 1910, he suffered several heart attacks and died later that night. Before he died, his mistress, Alice Keppel, visited the king. Bertie's wife allowed her to do so. After the king died, Alexandra refused to allow anyone to move Bertie's body for days afterwards. On the 11th of May, Alexandra finally allowed his body to be dressed and moved. His coffin was moved on the 14th of May to the throne room, where it lay in state. Three days later, his coffin was moved to Westminster Hall and the royal family attended a brief service. The hall was then opened to the public and over 400,000 people filed past the coffin. On the 20th of May 1910, the King's coffin was moved from London to Windsor Castle and buried at St George's Chapel. The Life of Alice, Grand Duchess of Hesse and by Rhine Princess Alice was born on the 25th of April 1843 in Buckingham Palace. After having their first son, her parents Queen Victoria and Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, as well as the public, eagerly awaited the arrival of a second son. However, this was not to be the case. The Privy Council even sent her father a letter of congratulations and condolences on the birth of their second daughter. Alice's life was not one you would imagine a princess would have. She was educated in a strict regime and wore humble clothing. Their rooms were constantly cold due to her mother loving the chill. Alice was extremely empathetic compared to her siblings, and she got on well with all of them, especially her older siblings Vicky and Bertie. Alice wanted to experience what life was like outside the confines of the royal household, and would often visit the working tenants at Balmoral. One day she escaped her governess and attended a local church. Though one of the gentler siblings, she was known to have a temper and would lash out at her siblings when they annoyed her. Queen Victoria was keen that her children would marry in love matches, but only from the upper class or royalty. Alice's sister Vicky, who had recently married, compiled a list of eligible royal bachelors, only finding two men suitable, William, Prince of Orange, and Prince Albert of Prussia. The family of the Prince of Orange were beside themselves with happiness at the prospect of him marrying an English princess. However, Alice did not like either man. After the two choices had crashed and burned, Vicky started to look for another match for her sister and she landed on Prince Louis of Hesse. Queen Victoria invited him to Windsor Castle and the couple hit it off. They loved each other's company 
and Louis asked for her autograph as a keepsake. Queen Victoria started to make plans for the couple to wed, but then tragedy struck. Her grandmother died. Alice had nursed her grandmother to the end. She felt great sadness at the loss of her grandmother, and she had been close to her. Alice became the family caregiver, and she comforted her mother. In November 1861, her father became seriously ill, and Alice took on the role of caring for him. By December, all hope was lost, and Prince Albert passed away on the 14th of December 1861. The fallout of his death plunged the royal family into a deep mourning. While still in mourning, Alice continued to plan her wedding, and the Queen insisted that the wedding go ahead. The wedding occurred on the 1st of July 1862. It was not a fairy tale wedding. It should have been the happiest day of Alice's life, but it was more of a nightmare. Her wedding was downsized from a church to the dining room of her childhood home. She was also expected to change back into black mourning clothes once the ceremony ended. The Queen made the wedding about herself and her sons had to stand in front of her to shield her from prying eyes during the ceremony. The Queen noted that it was more of a funeral than a wedding. Alice moved into Louis's home in Darmstadt. Crowds welcomed her with cheers and she wrote to her mother, that she had never received such a hearty welcome before. Though happy with her new home, Alice was homesick. Queen Victoria had envisioned Alice would get a newly built palace, but that was not to be the case. Louis's father had inadequate and dwindling finances and he refused to waste what little income he had to build the newlyweds a new home. Instead, Alice and Louis lived in a simple house overlooking the old quarter of Darmstadt, a far cry from a palace. Despite this, Alice tried to make her lodgings as homely as possible. Alice became pregnant soon after the wedding and gave birth to a total of seven children throughout her marriage. Victoria, Elizabeth, Irene, Ernest, Louis, Friedrich, Alex and Marie. Alice was passionate about breastfeeding and she experienced resistance from her mother who hated the thought of her daughters doing this. In 1870, Alice gave birth to her second son Friedrich and soon after the birth she came to realise there was something wrong with her son. Her son had haemophilia, a genetic condition that prevents blood clotting. Alice was a carrier and passed it on to her son. She also passed the gene on to two of her daughters, Irene and Alex, who were carriers as well. Everyone feared that Friedrich would pass soon and he would die in a devastating way. On the 29th of May, 1873, the boy fell out of a window. This fall could have been fatal for any child and for Friedrich it was. He did not die on impact, and the doctors tried their best to control the bleeding, but he passed away, leaving his parents heartbroken. Alice was plagued with grief for years, and she never got over the loss of her youngest son. To cope with the loss, Alice kept her only living son close. At this time, her marriage was also not in the best state. Louis was a kind man, but he was emotionally stunted and he was unable to offer much support to his struggling wife. She was disappointed in her husband's response to their son's death. She became increasingly full of resentment and she was not afraid to let him know. She wrote to him to confess how she was feeling. In 1877, Louis's father passed away and Louis became the Grand Duke of Hesse and Bayreine. Alice became the Grand Duchess she struggled with her new role and wrote to her mother for advice. Her concerns fell on deaf ears as her mother belittled her. The end was near for Alice. In November 1878, Alice's oldest daughter, Victoria, complained of a stiff neck. 
it would soon become clear that Victoria had contracted diphtheria, a bacterial infection that was often fatal in the Victorian era. Initially, Alice was able to dodge the infection. All but one of her children fell ill with the disease. Elizabeth was the only member of the family to not fall ill and she was sent away to live with her paternal grandmother for the time. Louis also fell ill with diphtheria. On the 15th of November, Marie, Alice's youngest child, died of the disease. Alice tried to keep it a secret as she did not want to dampen her loved one's spirits as they were also fighting the disease. She eventually informed her son, Ernest Louis, who was so crushed by the news that he required his mother's comfort. Despite introducing a strict no-contact order in the house, Alice went against this and kissed her son's forehead. This was to prove fatal. By December, Alice became seriously ill with diphtheria and in the early hours of the 14th of December 1878 Alice whispered her final words Dear Papa and passed away. She had died on the anniversary of her father's death. The life of Alfred, Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Alfred was born on the 6th of August 1844 in Windsor Castle. The long-awaited second son he was nicknamed Afi by his family. Like his siblings, Alfred had a strict education that started from when he was very young. At the age of 12, Alfred decided to join the Royal Navy. And in 1858, he passed his entrance exam. He was appointed as Naval Cadet of HMS Urialis. During an official visit to the Cape Colony, now known as the Cape of Good Hope, Alfred made a good impression and he took part in hunting while there. In 1862, Alfred was chosen as the heir to King Otto of Greece, but this decision was blocked by the British government on the behest of the Queen. Queen Victoria hoped that her second son would succeed as the Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Alfred had much success in the Navy and was promoted to lieutenant in 1863 and captain in 1866. That same year, Queen Victoria gave Alfred the title of Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Ulster and Earl of Kent, as well as a large allowance. In June 1866, Alfred took his seat in the House of Lords. In 1867, Alfred became the first member of the British royal family to visit Australia, and he spent nearly five months there. The following year, he visited Australia again, and was invited to a picnic by Sir William Manning. During this picnic, Alfred was wounded by a revolver fired by Henry James O'Farrell. He was shot to the right of his spine, during the violent struggle for the gun, William Vile, the man who organised the picnic, wrestled the gun away from O'Farrell and for saving Alfred's life, Vile was awarded a gold watch. Another bystander, George Thorne, was shot in the foot. O'Farrell was arrested, tried, convicted and hanged a month later. Alfred recovered from his injury. After being tended to by nurses trained by Florence Nightingale, he resumed command of his ship, returning home in April 1868. In 1869, Alfred visited Hawaii and spent time with the royal family there. Later that year, he travelled to both New Zealand and Japan becoming both the first member of the British royal family to visit New Zealand and the first European prince to visit Japan. While in Japan, he met the teenaged Emperor Meiji. Alfred travelled extensively in his life and travelled to India, Sri Lanka and Hong Kong. By the mid-1860s, Queen Victoria was searching for a bride for her second son. She wrote to her eldest daughter, Victoria, 
Princess Royal to assist. The Princess Royal suggested Princess Dagmar of Denmark as a potential bride but retracted the suggestion due to Germany and Denmark being at loggerheads over the territories of Schleswig-Holstein. Dagmar later married Alexander III of Russia, becoming the Empress of Russia. Eventually, a marriage with Grand Duchess Maria Alexandrovna of Russia, the only surviving daughter of Alexander II of Russia, was considered and accepted. The couple wed on the 23rd of January 1874 at the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. The marriage was not a happy one and the bride was unimpressed by London and England. She was used to grand palaces and large balls and was surprised to discover that she had to take lower precedence behind her sister-in-law, the Princess of Wales. Queen Victoria allowed Maria to take precedence immediately after the Princess of Wales to resolve this conflict. The couple took up residence in Clarence House when in London. The couple had six children together, Alfred, Marie, Victoria Melita, Alexandra, Beatrice and a stillborn son. Alfred continued to have a career in the Navy throughout his marriage to Maria. For many years, Alfred and his family lived in Malta while he was stationed there and their third child was born there in 1876. By 1893, Alfred reached the rank of Admiral of the Fleet. Alfred introduced many improvements in signalling and manoeuvring of ships during his time in the Navy. Alfred loved music and helped establish the Royal College of Music in 1882. He loved to play the violin, oftentimes this would be his party trick, however he was not very good at it. On the 22nd of August 1893, Ernest II, Duke of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha passed away. He had no children with his wife and so the dukedom passed to Alfred. Alfred's older brother, Albert, had renounced his and his children's succession rights to the dukedom. Alfred surrendered his British allowance and his seat in the House of Lords and Privy Council. He still maintained Clarence House as his London home. Though treated with coldness at first, Alfred soon grew popular in Coburg. Alfred, his wife and children moved to Coburg and took up residence in Slosh Rosenau. Alfred loved to collect glass and ceramics and his collection was valued at half a million marks at the time of his death. Alfred and Maria had only one son, Alfred, who became known as the hereditary prince of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. The hereditary prince shot himself at his parents' 25th wedding anniversary celebration. Alfred survived but was sent to Moran to recover. He didn't and two weeks later he died on the 6th of February 1899, leaving his parents devastated at his loss. Just over a year later, Alfred would die of throat cancer on the 30th of July 1900. He was buried in the ducal family's mausoleum in Coburg. His nephew, Prince Charles Edward, Duke of Albany, succeeded Alfred as the Duke. Alfred was the third child of Queen Victoria to die before her. The Life of Princess Helena of the United Kingdom One of the least remembered children of Queen Victoria, much of what we know about Helena comes from her mother's diaries. Helena was born on the 25th of May, 1846. Her birth caused much panic as she was born blue. Thankfully, she quickly recovered and was a mostly healthy child. As she grew up, Helena had to fight for attention amongst a brood of eight siblings. This strengthened her character and she even punched one of her brothers on the nose when they teased her. Helena grew up to be quite competitive and wanted to be the best at everything. She had many talents. She was an avid piano player, 
rode horses, and could draw. She also learned how to cook, clean, and farm. For the most part, her childhood was relatively happy, and she spent much time with her parents compared to other royal children of the time. However, in 1861, her happy childhood would end when her father, Prince Albert, died. Her mother became so grief-stricken that she made her children's lives unbearable. The children living at home moved to Osborne House and had to keep their grieving mother company. Despite expecting support from her children, Queen Victoria gave very little support to her grieving children, who had just lost their father. Helena found this time especially lonely. She was more sensitive than her sisters and was quick to burst into tears at the slightest bit of drama. For this reason, her mother chose Helena's younger sister, Louise, as her assistant and her older sister, Alice, as her secretary. In 1862, Princess Alice married and Helena replaced her as her mother's secretary. She excelled at the role and became a good companion for her mother. With little affection and support from her family, Helena found support in Karl Ruland, her father's former private secretary. Helena came to love him and when her mother found out about the affair, Victoria fired Ruland, sparking furious rows between the mother and daughter. Victoria was keen to have her daughter married off to avoid any more scandals. Helena was not deemed conventionally beautiful and being the middle child in a large brood of children made her marriage prospects less secure. Her mother also had a condition for any marriage, that Helena had to stay in England near her mother, which made finding her a husband all the more difficult. Prince Christian of Schleswig-Holstein was chosen as Helena's husband. He was much older than her and came from poor connections. His family's duchies were being fought over by Prussia and Denmark. The possible marriage caused much division in the family, with several members being against the match for various reasons. Despite this, Christian and Helena were extremely happy together. The Queen put her foot down and the wedding went ahead on the 5th of July, 1866. Helena and her husband had a quiet married life together. He was the perfect husband and they devoted themselves to each other. True to her word, Helena stayed close to her mother's residence, but found her role as secretary increasingly difficult, especially when she became pregnant. She had six children, Christian Victor, Albert, Helena Victoria, Mary Louise, Harold and a stillborn son. Unfortunately, her third son, Harold, died eight days after his birth plunging the parents into immense grief. Helena conceived soon after and gave birth just under a year later to a stillborn son. Helena felt that the world was against her and the couple had no more children. The numerous pregnancies took their toll on the princess's health and she was often unwell, something her mother was unsympathetic about. Victoria believed that her daughter was just a hypochondriac However, this was far from the case. Helena suffered from rheumatism, joint pain, and severe congestion of her lungs. Some of her lifestyle choices certainly didn't help this. She became addicted to opium to cope with her pain. Most of the time, Helena refused medical attention if she could help it, and she was possibly suffering from PTSD from the trauma of losing her father and two sons. Tragedy would strike her family again when her elder sister Alice died from diphtheria in 1878. Though different in many ways, Alice and Helena were there for each other when it counted, and the death of her sister hit Helena particularly hard. Receiving no support from her mother pushed Helena closer to her husband, and they built a life together, spending much time together. In 1887, Helena became the president of the British Nurses Associations and she used her influence to support the idea of creating a nurses registry to improve the education and status of nurses at the time. 
By this point, her opioid addiction was causing much concern in her family. Her mother, who was never concerned about her child's health, was very much worried about Helena. Christian became increasingly worried and begged the doctors to stop giving his wife the drugs. The doctors did so and when Helena found out she was furious, she was unable to get the drugs she needed and went into withdrawal, becoming extremely ill. Helena eventually overcame her addiction and this should have been celebrated but it was overshadowed when her eldest son Christian Victor died. Helena was proud of her children, especially her eldest, who was a major in the British Army. He was often in battle and far away from home. When he left for a trip in South Africa, he caught malaria and died in October 1900. Helena took the news as well as could be expected. On the 22nd of January 1901, Queen Victoria died. Helena and her youngest sister, Beatrice, comforted their mother on her deathbed and each other when she later died. With her death marked the change in the family's dynamics. One by one, Helena lost touch with her siblings, but the loss of her eldest brother, Edward VII, also known as Bertie in the family, hit her especially hard. Bertie and his wife, Alexandra, kept her at arm's length. Alexandra never forgave Helena for the betrayal of Helena marrying her husband Christian, whose territories were being fought over by Alexandra's homeland of Denmark. Alexandra got her revenge though. Helena was passionate about nursing, but Alexandra decided that she too was interested in the cause and demanded the position of president. Helena had to give up the position to Alexandra, who ranked higher than her in the order of precedence. Her brother would die in 1910, and four years later, Britain and Europe would be plunged into war. Helena's only surviving son fought for the Prussian army. She lost contact with him. None of Helena's children had gone on to have children in marriage, and only her daughter, Princess Mary Louise, married. Helena was upset at never becoming a grandmother, but little did she know that she actually had a granddaughter. Albert had fathered a daughter called Valerie Marie with a woman of high noble birth whose name is unknown. It is not clear whether Helena knew of Valerie Marie or not. Christian and Helena celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary in 1916. The first couple in the British royal family to celebrate this milestone, he would pass a year later. Their marriage, that had been so opposed, had stood the test of time. Six years later, in 1923, Helena fell ill, and on the 9th of June 1923, she suffered a fatal heart attack and died. The Life of Louise, Duchess of Argyle Born on the eve of many European revolutions, Louise certainly showed herself to be a strong, opinionated individual. She was born on the 18th of March 1848 and was the sixth of nine children born to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Her birth was assisted with chloroform, a controversial pain relief at the time. From an early age, Louise was a firecracker who was almost too curious for her family. She was prone to asking questions, so much so that she earned the nickname Little Miss Y. Her rebelliousness only developed further as she grew older. When Louise was just 13 years old, her father, Prince Albert, passed away. The death of her father was extremely hard for the princess. Her mother was engulfed in her own grief and did not give any support to her children. Louise felt very alone, unable to get the help she needed for her grief. For four years, Louise and her siblings remained at home, out of the eye of the public. When Louise turned 17, she hoped to enter society. Grand balls were a huge part for the Victorian elite, and when a child came of age, they would have a coming out ball. Louise was expecting to have a grand ball, but was disappointed and furious when her mother cancelled the occasion. 
Queen Victoria decided that mourning for Prince Albert was more important and no one was allowed to have fun in her presence. Despite having a stormy relationship with her mother, Louise and her mother worked together. Louise was her assistant and later secretary. Louise found the work boring but found entertainment elsewhere. Rumours began to spread that Louise was involved in an affair with her younger brother's tutor, Robinson Duckworth. The Queen found out and dismissed the tutor. Louise despised her mother's endless rules and protocol, and so she ventured out into the world. She became a famed artist, learning her skills from the National Art Training School. She became a sculptor, in a time when it was considered unladylike for a woman to sculpt. Louise rebelled against the status quo. Louise was connected to several men during her life. She was the Victorian ideal of a beauty, and she was often called the Queen's most beautiful daughter. So it is no surprise that men were falling for her. At 18, Louise had an affair with Walter Sterling, one of her brother's tutors and it was rumoured that Louise became pregnant from this affair. Unmarried, this would have caused real concern for the royal family and would have damaged Louise's reputation. The man who started the rumour was Charles Lowcock, the man who had delivered all of the Queen's children. Lowcock's son, Frederick, adopted the baby, named Henry, in 1867, which at the time was a very strange thing for an unmarried man to do. Frederick also received a large allowance and was given an apartment in St. James's Palace. Henry Lowcock's descendants have applied for permission to test the DNA of Henry's coffin to that of Tsarina Alexandra of Russia to check for a match, but they were refused, meaning the truth will never be fully known. Louise felt passionately about serving the ornate British people. Using her influence as her mother's secretary, Louise helped to open a children's hospital and became the face of royal philanthropy. Though Louise was able to enjoy her twenties, the expectations of marriage was looming over her. The Queen was set about finding her a husband. Louise did not want to marry royalty, as she already had to struggle with her own royal family and did not want to deal with another royal family. Louise grew close to a man by the name of John Campbell. Though not a prince, he was from the nobility. Much of her siblings were against the match, but the Queen saw sense and allowed her daughter to wed John. The couple married at St George's Chapel on the 21st of March 1871. For the first time since Henry VIII, a person of royal blood had married a member of the British nobility. This caused intense curiosity and huge crowds formed outside the church. Policemen were called in to form barriers to keep control. The couple honeymooned in Surrey before residing in Kensington Palace. Campbell was chosen by the Prime Minister in 1878 to be Canada's Governor General and the couple moved to Canada for the job. During her time in Canada, Louise promoted the founding of the National Gallery of Canada and the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts. The people of Canada loved her and the province of Alberta was named in her honour. In 1880, Louise was involved in a sleigh accident. The carriage overturned and Louise was dragged through the snow for 400 metres. She sustained a concussion and a torn earlobe, but recovered. Louise had a good heart and used her wealth and influence to create a medical fund that could provide assistance to men fighting in the Northwest Rebellion. Her actions in Canada caused a bit of jealousy for her siblings, who were under the watchful eye of their mother and thus were trapped by the Queen's protocols. When Louise returned to Britain, she didn't receive much of a welcome. Louise was close to a few family members, one of whom was her brother-in-law, Prince Henry of Battenberg, her sister Beatrice's husband. She possibly got on too well with him, and people began to suspect that she was in having an affair with him. We will never truly know for sure. When Prince Henry passed in 1896, Louise remarked that he was the greatest friend she had ever had, and that she would miss him more than Beatrice.
The affair rumours were fueled further by her own marriage. Louise and John were not in a happy marriage and they lived separate lives. John may have been gay, but Louise was fairly open-minded and didn't seem to care, as their marriage was built for convenience more than anything else. Something that Queen Victoria was unhappy with her daughter about was that Louise was a feminist. Louise was a very vocal supporter for the suffragette movement. Louise used her wealth to help ordinary people, especially widows. She would often pay for funerals so widows could give their husbands proper burials. When her mother was set to celebrate 50 years on the throne, a sculpture was being commissioned for the Queen. Louise wanted to sculpt the statue, but the Queen told her to submit the design anonymously and the best piece would be chosen. When Louise's design was chosen, people doubted that it was hers, but Louise proved herself to be a capable and talented artist. In 1900, John's father passed and John became the ninth Duke of Argyll with Louise as his duchess. Though they didn't have a very loving marriage, Louise was dedicated to her husband. As they grew older, their friendship grew and flourished. John became unwell and from 1911, Louise began to take care of her husband. He passed in 1914 and the loneliness and grief she felt was immense. Louise became close to her sister Beatrice as she got older. They were neighbours and lived in Kensington Palace in adjoining rooms. Louise lived until the age of 91, passing on the 3rd of December 1939. The life of Arthur, Duke of Connacht and Strathern Prince Arthur was one of Queen Victoria's longest lived children. Born on the 1st of May 1850, he was the third son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Like his siblings, he received a strict education. It has been reported that he was his mother's favourite child. Arthur, like his brother Alfred, was interested in the military. In 1866, he followed through with this interest and enrolled at the Royal Military College in Woolwich. He graduated in 1868 and served a long career in the military. After he graduated, he was commissioned as Lieutenant in the Corps of Royal Engineers before being transferred to the Royal Regiment of Artillery and then to the Rifle Brigade. He travelled extensively in the army, serving in South Africa, Canada, Ireland, Egypt and India. While in Canada, Arthur undertook training and engaged in defending the country from Fenian raids. These raids were carried out by the Fenian Brotherhood, an Irish Republican organisation based in the US but also had outposts in Canada. After arriving in Canada, Arthur toured the country for two months before proceeding to the US where he visited Washington DC and met the US President, President Grant. Arthur also entertained Canadian society, attending an investiture ceremony, balls and garden parties. He became the first member of the British royal family to attend the opening of Parliament. In 1870, he fended off Fenian invaders during the Battle of Eccles Hill and received the Fenian Medal. In 1869, Arthur received the great honour of being bestowed the title of Chief of the Six Nations by the Iroquois of the Grand River Reserve in Ontario. Arthur received the name Cavacouge and was allowed to sit in the tribe's council and vote on matters of tribe governance. Many Canadians were pleased with Arthur and hoped he would return as Governor General. Arthur rose through the ranks of the army, becoming an honorary colonel in 1871, lieutenant colonel in 1876, colonel in 1880 and a general in 1893. In 1900, he received the post of Commander-in-Chief of Ireland, and in 1904 until 1907, he was the Inspector General of the Forces. On Queen Victoria's birthday in 1874, she gave Arthur the title of Duke of Connacht and Strathern and Earl of Sussex. In 1899, his nephew Prince Alfred of Edinburgh, the hereditary Prince of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, died. 
Arthur was next in line, but decided to renounce his and his son's succession rights to the duchy. Thus, the duchy passed to another one of Arthur's nephews, Prince Charles Edward, the son of Arthur's brother, Prince Leopold. On the 13th of March, 1879, in St. George's Chapel, Arthur married Princess Louise Margaret of Prussia, and they had three children together, Margaret, Arthur and Patricia. They lived together in Bagshock Park and Clarence House when they were in London. Though devoted to his wife, Arthur was unfaithful. He had an affair with Leonie, Lady Leslie, that lasted for many years. The Duke served the crown and continued to take on royal duties. In 1903, the Duke and Duchess represented the new Edward VII at the Delhi Durbar and before this on their way to India, they stopped in Egypt. While there, Arthur opened the Aswan Dam. In 1911, George V appointed Arthur as Governor General of Canada. Arthur, Louise and Patricia lived there and were popular with Canadians. They travelled throughout Canada and in 1917, Arthur laid a block on Parliament Hill as his brother Edward VII had done in 1860. While in Canada, Arthur learned to ice skate and hosted skating parties. He also enjoyed camping, hunting and fishing. During the First World War, Arthur remained in Canada. He emphasised the need for military training and readiness of the Canadian troops. However, as Governor General, Arthur had little say in the Canadian military and had to be content with his role. Louise and Patricia worked for charitable organisations during the war. Following the war, Arthur had a stained glass window commissioned in memory of the fallen soldiers of Canada and had it placed in St. Bartholomew's Church where they attended regularly. Even into old age, Arthur served the royal family, but retired from public life in 1928. His wife died in 1917 and Arthur would outlive her for over 20 years. Two of his children would die before him. Margaret died in 1920, possibly from sepsis, and Arthur died in 1938 from stomach cancer. The Duke passed away on the 16th of January 1942 at the age of 91. He was the exact same age to the day as his older sister Louise had been when she died. He was Queen Victoria's last surviving son. The life of Leopold, Duke of Albany. Prince Leopold was born on the 7th of April 1853. He was the youngest son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. His birth was aided with chloroform, which was a controversial pain relief at the time. Initially believed to have been born healthy, his health would decline over the years. Despite eating plenty, he remained thin and weak. When he was a toddler, he would move around and would bruise very easily. His parents searched for answers, and the answer was a fatal one. He was diagnosed with haemophilia. In the Victorian era, haemophilia was often fatal, and children born with the condition rarely survived adulthood. Haemophilia is a genetic disorder that causes delayed blood clotting, and it is X-linked, meaning women who have two X chromosomes are able to compensate for an altered gene and thus are only carriers of the condition, meaning they do not have the condition themselves, but they have the gene for the condition. Men having only one X chromosome are more likely to inherit the condition and suffer the effects. It is a genetic condition, meaning it is inherited rather than obtained during life. Three of Victoria and Albert's children would be affected by haemophilia. Alice, Leopold and Beatrice. Alice and Beatrice were carriers. Leopold's parents worried greatly about their son and no one would believe he would survive to adulthood. His family did not handle his condition well. 
Queen Victoria grew to be very protective of her son, but to the point of controlling every aspect of his life. When he was eight years old, Leopold's father died, and his mother became grief-stricken and overbearing to her children living at home. Leopold wanted to join the military, like his older brothers, but due to his condition, his mother banned him from service. Since he could not be physically active, Leopold turned his attention towards mental activities. He had the best tutors and Leopold was naturally academic, so he was a delight to teach. Once Leopold reached adolescence, he became tired of his mother's overbearing nature. He wanted to break free and Leopold decided university was the way. He pleaded with his mother to allow him to attend the University of Oxford, and she finally relented when he turned 19. For the first time in his life, Leopold had some semblance of independence. While in Oxford, he studied a variety of subjects. In 1876, he received his honorary doctorate in civil law. In 1881, Leopold was given the titles of Duke of Albany, Earl of Clarence and Baron Arklow. Leopold knew that the only way he could ever truly get out from under his mother's thumb was to marry. He started his quest for a wife by looking around Europe for an eligible bride. While as a Prince of the United Kingdom, Leopold should have had no issue finding a bride. His haemophilia caused him to be seen as unappealing to many European princesses. Many princesses rejected him. His mother got involved and set him up on a blind date with Princess Helen of Waldeck Pyrmont. She was quite educated for a woman of her time and could compete with Leopold on an intellectual level. They were both impressed with each other and it wasn't long before they were wed. They married on the 27th of April 1882. The wedding was a fairy tale. They had a wonderful marriage and they complemented each other in many ways. Leopold gained much independence with his wife. Their first child, Alice, was born in 1883. As a child born to a parent with haemophilia, Alice was a carrier of haemophilia. But the impact of haemophilia would not be seen until many years in the future. Helen was pregnant again in 1884. The couple were in the prime of their lives and envisioned a long, happy future together with their growing family. However, that was not to be the case. Leopold suffered from joint pain throughout his life and with the English winter, the cold exacerbated the stiffness and pain he felt. On his doctor's orders, Leopold went to Cannes for the warmer climate. Helen was pregnant and could not go, but urged Leopold to go. On the 27th of March, 1884, Leopold slipped and fell, hitting his head. He fell unconscious and died the next morning, from a cerebral bleed. He was buried in Windsor. His death devastated his young wife. His pregnant wife gave birth to their only son, Charles Edward, on the 19th of July, 1884, four months later. Charles Edward immediately succeeded his father as the Duke of Albany. The Life of Princess Beatrice of the United Kingdom Beatrice was the youngest child of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. As is often the case with the last born child, she was treated as the baby of the family. Beatrice was born on the 14th of April 1857 in Buckingham Palace. Her parents spoiled her, and her mother, who was notorious for finding babies ugly, found Beatrice to be beautiful. With an age gap of four years between her and her next sibling, Leopold, and an age gap of 16 years between her and her eldest sibling, Vicky, Beatrice was not very close to her older siblings, and as her siblings married, her home became lonelier. When Beatrice was only four years old, her father died and her mother became dependent on Beatrice for emotional support, something a young child should never have to do. 
Queen Victoria would often take Beatrice from her bed and wrap her in her father's nightclothes and have Beatrice sleep beside her. After 1871, with all her sisters married, Victoria relied heavily on Beatrice for support. She became her mother's secretary and during a period of illness in 1871, Beatrice wrote diary entries for her mother as her mother dictated out loud. Although the Queen was against her youngest daughter marrying, a number of suitors came forward. Napoleon Eugène, the French Prince Imperial and heir of Emperor Napoleon III of France, grew close to Beatrice and rumours began to circulate of a possible engagement between the two. These rumours ended with Napoleon's death in 1879. Beatrice was devastated at the loss and received much support from her mother. Louis IV, Grand Duke of Hesse, was also suggested as the possible husband for Beatrice. He was the widower of Beatrice's sister Alice, who had died in 1878. However, this was forbidden by law and so it never happened. Other candidates, such as Prince Alexander and Prince Louis of Battenberg, were rejected. Prince Louis of Battenberg married Beatrice's niece, Princess Victoria of Hesse and Bayreuth. During the wedding, Beatrice met Prince Henry, the brother of Louis, and they fell in love. Upon returning to Britain, Beatrice expressed her desire to marry Henry. She was met with silence from her mother, and the two did not talk for seven months, only communicating by note. Only after being persuaded by Beatrice's sister-in-law, the Princess of Wales, and her sister, the Crown Princess of Prussia, did Victoria begin to talk to her daughter again. Victoria consented to the marriage only on the condition that Beatrice and Henry remain in Britain close to the Queen. Beatrice and Henry married each other on the 23rd of July 1885 in St Mildred's Church in Osborne. After a short honeymoon, Beatrice and Henry returned to the Queen. The longer they were married, the stronger Beatrice's love for Henry grew. The English court grew brighter and happier after the wedding of Princess Beatrice and gave Victoria a new lease of life. Henry was determined to take part in the military, which annoyed the Queen. She was opposed to his participation in the army. Henry felt oppressed by his mother-in-law, especially when she sent a warship to bring him back to England after he went to Corsica with his brother Louis. Beatrice continued to work as her mother's secretary. The Queen criticised Beatrice when a week before she gave birth to her first child, she chose to eat in her rooms rather than with the Queen. Beatrice used chloroform during her deliveries and gave birth to four children, Alexander, Ina, Leopold and Morris. Henry was bored by the lack of activity at court and longed for employment. In response, the Queen gave him the position of Governor of the Isle of Wight, but this was not enough. He pleaded to be allowed to join the Ashanti expedition fighting in the Anglo-Asante War, and eventually the Queen allowed him to. Only a month later, in January 1896, Henry died of malaria. Despite her grief, Beatrice remained her mother's companion, and Victoria tried to comfort her daughter. The Queen knew her daughter needed a place of her own and she gave the Kensington Palace apartments once occupied by the Queen and the Duchess of Kent to her daughter. Mrs. life was forever changed when her mother died in 1901. Her position at court was diminished. She was not close to her brother Bertie who was now Edward VII and they often got into arguments. One such argument was when Bertie attempted to sell Osborne House. Queen Victoria had left Beatrice and Louise houses on the estate and the selling of Osborne House would threaten their privacy. Bertie extended the land around their homes to compensate for their loss of privacy and went on to give the house to the nation. From 1896 to 1944, Beatrice was the governor of the Isle of Wight. From 1901 until 1931, Beatrice edited her mother's diaries, something that greatly distressed George V and Queen Mary. 
her editing was done to protect those living, but also removed important information that would have been valuable from a historical standpoint to truly understand Queen Victoria's point of view in events. Beatrice continued to appear in public after her mother's death, but most of her engagements were related to her mother. Beatrice continued to live on the Isle of Wight in Osborne Cottage until Carisbrook Castle, the home of the Governor of Isle of Wight, became vacant. She sold Osborne Cottage and moved into the castle. She also continued to live in Kensington Palace as well. In 1914, Beatrice's favourite son Morris died fighting in the First World War. Another son, Leopold, died in 1922 from a knee operation having inherited haemophilia and hemorrhage during the surgery. Beatrice eventually withdrew from public life and lived her last days in Brant Bridge Park in Sussex. She passed away on the 26th of October 1944, the last child of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to die.